Thank you very much. Do I need the microphone? Fine, I think you can probably hear me. Uh, no, I, I like standing so that I'm on my feet, ready for a quick getaway. <laughs> things turn so nasty, which you never know. But not, I'm sure, in, in digression. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here again. I think I'm involved in all of the conferences in this series, and I'm very proud uh, to have been invited. the surprise. Um, when Mahatma Gandhi came to London in 1946, he was treated as a celebrity. He came out wearing know, his loincloth, a little diminutive um, Asian man, and he was shown around the grand sites of London uh, and taken to all the monuments and the uh, testaments to our imperial past, which he had suffered so badly from. And then at the end, he was asked by a journalist, Well, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And he replied, I think it would be a very good thing. <laughs> well, I have become associated with criticisms of moral enhancement, but I'm not against moral enhancement. I just want to make this clear at the start. I'm not against moral enhancement at all. I think it would be a very good thing. I just don't think there is anything that remotely qualifies to be called moral enhancement. And my presentation Today we'll just discuss one aspect of why I continue to think that all of those who think it's currently possible are misguided, not in their aspirations to look for it, but in their mistaken idea that they might have found it or even found a plausible road to it. And at the end I will possibly say what I think the plausible road is. Uh, I apologize for one other thing. Um, Eric, who's going to speak next, and I have been given slightly longer than other speakers to this, and I apologize for this <coughs> terrible injustice, which, like all terrible injustices, I find reprehensible, but that doesn't mean that I'm not going to take advantage of it. <laughs> so, uh, uh, I'm going to speak slightly longer than, uh, than the average, uh, possibly Eric will do the same. So this is a chapter from uh, my, my next book called How to Be Good. Um, I read it some time ago and I only delivered it once before in public. Um, and I'll come on to something about that in a moment. I want to start, those of you who've read the abstracts, with um, a song from Shakespeare's great play, The Merchant of Venice. So I'm not going to sing it, but I shall, I shall speak it. Tell me, where is fancy bread? Or in the heart, or in the head? How begot, how nourished? It is engendered in the eyes, with gazing fed, and fancy dies in the cradle where it lies. Let us all ring fancy to now. I'll begin it, ding dong bell. Now, this song, is sung while Bassanio chooses the casket which would give him and his love Portia's heart's desire, namely that they will be able to marry one another. But the lesson of that play, the whole play really, is about the importance not of fancy, but judgment. What is needed is not fancy, but Judgment. The Merchant of Venice is a play all about judgment and misjudgment. And it is my argument that if we are looking for a root to moral enhancement, it is in judgment that we will find the answer. A very different account, and one that I'm going to examine in this talk this morning, <coughs> tells us that fancy and indeed true love and true morality are neither bred in the heart nor in the head, at least as Shakespeare understood these ideas, but are simply molecules acting on the brain. Neuroscience is now developing interventions that act directly on the brain, influencing behaviour, attitudes and dispositions, and indeed causing wonderful music that is being played in this room. <laughs>
A recent report from the United Kingdom Royal Society, of which I was a, a co-author, put the issue this way. The human brain is not viewed in the same way as other organs. The brain holds the key to mind and behavior, and so to most, it has a special status. The relatively young field of neuroscience is the study of the brain and the nervous system. The law is concerned with regulating behavior, and so it is reasonable to ask whether, and if so, how neuroscience could or should inform the law. And this raises the question that is in the heart of my remarks this morning, is there a science of morality? Now, I think there is. I think the science of morality is concerned with the question, how to be good? It is the preeminent question for ethics, although one that philosophers and ethicists seldom address head on. Knowing how to be good, or perhaps more modestly and more accurately, how to try to be good, how to, to know about trying, how to try to be good, is of immense theoretical and practical importance. This know-how is the business of a science of the good. The links between this highly theoretical question and the preoccupations of contemporary neuroscience and indeed the interests of the criminal law and indeed of those preoccupied with social policy, education, the common good and so on are all going to be explored very briefly in, uh, in what I say this morning. But I'm going to examine them through a lens which focuses on debates about how to affect moral enhancement or moral improvement in human beings, and particularly the attempts of a very famous American doctor of science, Patricia Smith Churchland, to achieve this in a relatively recent book of hers called Brain Trust. Indeed, Churchland has a somewhat unique status in the philosophy of neuroscience, although she pretty much does think that we are all indeed just neurons. What she asks, quote, does it mean for a system of neurons to care about or value something? And the answer, of course, is that neurons do not have a care in the world. The tale Churchland tells is one expressing a particular materialist theory of the mind and one that fits with a set of such theories that may or may not be susceptible depending on how they're interpreted. But I'm going to start with what Churchman has got absolutely right, and it's a very great deal. She says, quite rightly, and repeats repeatedly, that morality is, and all these are quotes from her book, morality is tethered to, has its foundations on, is constrained by, anchored to, prefigured in, our evolutionary origins. She calls this being, quote, tethered to the hard and fast. This is, I think, transparently, but unfortunately, trivially correct. So long, that is, as one takes a not very rigorous view of what terms like constrained, tethered, and so on actually mean. How are we tethered to our evolutionary past? As apes, or as their monocellular forebears. Having thus proposed to establish firm foundations, Churchland goes on to build an edifice that moves, I want to claim, seamlessly from the hard and fast to the fast and loose. Now, I did, I mentioned, present this uh, talk once before, and it was in at the Russia Foundation in Geneva, and Patricia Smith Churchland was there in the audience. Um, and uh, we eventually became reconciled about the event, but it took, it took some doing the reasons that will become apparent. What Churchill does, or at least does not do, does not talk about, but seems to assume, is just how constraining constraints on morality might be. So having attempted to sell us on the idea of firm foundations, and who could object to firm foundations, Churchill seems to think that she has liberty and license to make claims that, while consistent with such foundations, are no more entailed by them than, say, contemporary human thought is constrained by or tethered to 
whatever arbitrary stage of our evolutionary antecedents one might pick off the antecedents of the human brain that she might suggest. <coughs> I'm going to suggest, and have argued for many different occasions, that what matters morally, and for that matter cognitively, is not where we come from, interesting as that is, but where we are and where we're going. That's what matters. And our evolutionary past does not constrain or tether, but rather partially explains and enables further development. So we're not tethered to our past, we are liberated by it. Moreover, I'm going to argue that our evolutionary past does not predict in any material way and certainly does not significantly determine our future trajectory. To make sense of such an idea, it would first be necessary to identify an instance, a slice of that evolutionary past, and explain the nature of the constraint that it imposes. One such instance would have certainly to be a monocellular organism, and another might be our ape ancestor somewhere between five and seven million years ago in Africa. I appreciate that we humans and our successors are likely to remain organic or partially organic and carbon-based. But those constraints, I believe, are not particularly germane. I argue about them elsewhere in my new book, but I'm not going to say any more about them now. But we, as I say, are no more constrained by our eight ancestry than our eight ancestors were by their slight or slight equivalent ancestry. So let's look at what Chetzman makes of her freedom. She draws very pessimistic conclusions from the fact that there are moral disagreements. Let's look at one of the moral dilemmas of which she does attempt to make analysis. Now, I, just as an aside here, I don't think anything follows from a moral disagreement. I don't think morality is objective. And I argue this in the book that I refer to. It's objective as anything. The fact that there is disagreement about it is not germane. There are millions and millions and millions of, the, of people in the world that do not accept evolution. So I take evolution to be broadly speaking a correct scientific theory, a true theory. The fact that millions of people in the world don't accept it is no evidence that it's not a correct theory. What you have to do is explain where we've got to in some other way. And there's just one other hint as to what I mean by the objectiveness of morality. I think we all know what is good for us. We all know what's good for us. And I just give you one sort of suggested remark to hopefully convince you that this might be plausible, and that is we all know how to be prudent. If we didn't know what was good for us as creatures, the sorts of creatures that we are, we couldn't be prudent, but we can be prudent. We can take care of ourselves. When my son goes off in his car, I say, take care. And I, he knows and I know exactly what we need. And I, we all could think all of the awful things that might happen, but we don't want to happen. And all of the wonderful things that hopefully will happen during his life, and that we do want to happen. We know what's good, and we know what's bad. This is non problem And I won't say anything more about that now. This is the example that uh, Patricia Churchill uses, and I quote, in 1972, a bushfire, Martin Hartwell, courageously agreed to fly a mercy flight despite bad weather and tragically crashed the bush plane. His passengers included an Inuit child who desperately needed an appendectomy and a nurse belonging to care for him. The nurse died on impact and eventually the child died as well. With two broken legs, starving and near death, after many weeks of waiting in vain for rescue, Hartford, Hartwell consumed the leg of his friend, the dead nurse. Eventually, after 31 days in the bitter cold, he was rescued. And then Churchman goes on, on cannibalism in such extreme circumstances, opinion varies. And I am doubtful that there is a uniquely correct answer. Many well-fed people are horrified at the prospect of eating their dog, but the traditional Inuit are comparatively horrified 
of the idiocy of starving to death when eating a dog would keep him, would keep them alive. As we all know, rational people may disagree about the best way to handle the taxation or education or whatever, or when to wage preemptive wars. Often there are no right solutions. Now, I think Churchill's analysis of this case is extremely worrying. What she argues is, Repeatedly, many welfare people are horrified at the prospect of eating their dog. Well, they may or may not be. The question is, should they be horrified? The moral question is, should they be? Is there anything horrifying about it in the circumstances? What would morality enjoy? <coughs> if morality simply consists of attitudes, many people are horrified at the things to do with this, then of course there is no future for morality. At all. If it consists of feelings, then the only way to resolve a moral dispute is by further feelings. And this is the, the prospect um, so wonderfully done by um, Wittgenstein. If it is simply one feeling confirming another, then we really are in a situation that Wittgenstein lampooned is buying a second copy of the morning newspaper to confirm the truth of what you read in the first copy of that newspaper. So we need some sort of independent arbiter of what is morally better or worse, and it can't simply be feelings. It also cannot be that this independent arbiter of what is morally better or worse is something else that the uh, British Church talks about the number of constraints, that's a but I won't go into that now. So, if we are curious about what makes a choice best among all other possibilities, what are the criteria of best? Whatever they are, they will be the ones that best promote justice, the rights and interests of persons, animals, and the planet, and which best protect sentient individuals from suffering and harm, and so on. As I say, we know what the good is, and it's unproblematic. Whatever these morally relevant features are, they cannot be emotions, like being horrified, or disgusted, or sickened by something. These feelings are notoriously unreliable and susceptible to manipulation and prejudice of all sorts. They might, of course, be pro-social emotions of the sort of that many writers on this subject have talked about, including uh, Julian Sarasco, and Mark Person, and others. But that raises the underlying question of what makes an emotion pro-social? What is it to be pro-social? The concept of pro-sociality can be analyzed like any other concept. It has cognitive content. It's not just a feeling. It has cognitive content. Not simply or probably even emotional content, let alone molecular content. A pro-social emotion or pro-social anything else is one that is literally in favor of, pro, for the benefit of people or society. Insofar as it as pro-sociality is a surrogate for, or the equivalent of morality, it has to be plausibly related to what we all understand as good or bad for people and for society. What such pro-social or moral things are is a matter of evidence and argument, not of feeling. It is a matter of demonstrating in what ways action X or emotion X is good for people or bad for people. If we look for a plausible evolutionary precursor of morality rather than a precursor of cooperation, then rationality is a far better bet than pro-sociability or pro-sociality. I put it no higher than this because frankly it doesn't matter what the precursor foundations or roots of morality are. What matters is what morality requires, not what proto-morality might have required 
ลงเลยเนี่ยชูชลงบอกว่าให้คนตายเมื่อเขาสามารถรอดได้ถ้าเขาตายเพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวกเขาสามารถรอดได้เพราะพวก Of drawing attention to facts and uh, relation to beliefs, positions, rules, and so on. These things might be idiotic because they are self-defeating in terms of agreed moral objectives, and so on. In this case, the saving of the sorts of lives agreed by some other sorts of arguments to matter and to matter more than others. Self-defeating actions or policies. Are not necessarily pro-social in church lands sense, even when they save lives, because church is only interested in those lives whose mournful eyes are capable of engaging with those who are <coughs> beneficiaries of the look that is in those lives. <coughs> Tell me where is fancy bread or in the Past or in the past. Churchland, this is the end of my critique of her, specifically repudiates maximizing the number of lives saved, saved by any particular choice, and hence repudiates all those mournful lives which are beyond the narrow purview of her philosophy or moral gains, thereby aligning herself with the innumerate ethicists. Rightly ridiculed by their comfort. It is genuinely stupid to value lives, but only the lives that directly arouse our sympathetic attention. So, one of my main criticisms of the whole pro-sociality thing is: if you are beyond the Ambit of those in need, we may make the wrong sort of morals. We need to think not only of the plight of somebody suffering, uh, whose suffering is triggering because it's presence to our attention, our sympathetic response. We need to think about the others who are not drawn to our attention but may be suffering equally, and we don't want to be distracted either. By one and ignore the other. Ethics, as I argued elsewhere in my new book, ethics is for bad guys. The good guys don't. If there are any good guys in the world, the good guys don't need ethics. Ethics is a device for drawing our attention to things that we might otherwise ignore. Ethics is for those occasions on which altruism, sympathy, and sociality fail. Ethics. Is a body of theories designed to draw to our attention what matters, what matters, but might be beyond the limited range of our sympathetic gaze. Ethics is for bad guys, and since I'm a bad guy, I need ethics. I need a theory as to what should engage my moral interests. Even English law, not the most progressive. Or vehicles for morality recognizes that the idea of neighbor refers to more than vicinity, refers to more than what we can, what is beneath our noses. There is a famous, wonderful judgment in a famous legal case, and those from uh, common law traditions will all know of this case. It is Lord Atkins' famous judgment in Donahue and Stevenson, famous uh, uh, tort case, and Lord Atkin in his judgment. Ask the question: Who in law is my neighbour? But his answer is the answer to who is is our neighbour? Who is an appropriate object of our moral concern? This is what 
what Atkins said in that famous judgment. The answer seems to be, persons who are so closely and directly affected by my act that I ought reasonably to have them in contemplation as being so affected when I am directed my, directing my mind to the acts or omissions which are called in question. It is reason that alerts us to what might be beyond our own days and require our concern, and which helps us to understand what we can and should do about it. We really believe we always need to use moral reasoning to act as a guide to our emotions, whatever and however reliable we think our emotions are, and as a way of checking that we are having the appropriate feelings in appropriate circumstances. Prosociality is a concept. It has cognitive content and behavioral expressions of that idea have consequences which make them plausible as expressions of that idea. Such consequences may be inconsistent with or commensurable with the idea that may indeed frustrate or negate those impulses. At a time at which it is believed prosociality was a mechanism for the protection of an in-group from aliens or outsiders, prosociality had no more connection with morality than slugs have with humans. At such a stage in our evolutionary class, prosociality was simply prudential not moral, but to use a less intention, intentional and more objective description, was adapted rather than more moral. Behavior that is simply prudential will only be pro-social if it operates in the interests of relevant others. And it is the analysis of who the relevant others are that matters. Without any sense of irony or inconsistency, Churchill admires Mill, John Stuart Mill, for his identifying that, quote, the moral sphere is fundamentally about conduct that injures, damages, or harms others or their interests. But at the end, shows herself to be morally numerous by apparently also holding that this gives us no reason to minimize the perpetration of such harm, execrating those she calls maximizing consequential for wanting to minimize such harm and therefore maximize the benefits of accepting consequences. I think it's difficult to know how to take seriously someone who professes to believe in morality and tries, and in particular, a morality that tries to minimize harms to others or their interests, but needs but sees no imperative at all to minimize the number of suffering of such harms or to maximize benefits. Churchill, like many others, misunderstand, and I think this is my final idea, I think a very important point, misunderstands Bentham's famous injunction that each is to count for one and none for more than one. And that equality means equal consideration for all. The idea that all persons are equal and that each counts the same is a political principle. It speaks to treatment sanctioned by laws, officials, and institutions. Equality and human ethics do not require, as Churchill falsely believes, that mothers must sometimes abandon their own children in favor of the children of others. This does not, of course, imply that mothers must never put the interests of others before those of their own children, nor that they and theirs should make no sacrifices to secure their own for others. But it means that such sacrifices must be proportional. And of course, Churchill is not unaware of the importance of proportionality. The law, however, must treat all as equal. Churchill makes the mistake of thinking that consequentialists, utilitarians like me, are um, required always to put the general interest ahead. Only officials are required to. But that is where most of morality actually bites. What we want, I would suggest to you, is societies that have mechanisms 
for preventing as much harm. Those mechanisms are taxation <coughs> and redistribution, those mechanisms are public health care systems, those mechanisms are social welfare, those mechanisms are fire, police, and ambulance services. These are the mechanisms that we need in order to do justice. We cannot leave this to individual decision making. Most of where morality bites actually is in the public sphere. Individual morality is self-indulgent. What individuality requires of us is to put in place comprehensive systems of rescue, in quotes, that will maximize the life chances of all citizens and, by extension, all people in the world. No consequences. There are no consequences to fail to accept that. So most of what morality is, is <coughs> operates at the level of policy. We're not talking about what individuals should or should not do to protect the people they care about. We're interested in what they should implement at the level of legislation and policy so that all are equally protected. Recognizing so that they generalize their feelings for their to the people that matter to them. And I think this is the mistake made by all of the efforts at moral enhancement <coughs> that concentrate on our rather limited feelings for <coughs> one another. And we're trying to manipulate the mechanisms which ground those so-called impulses to pro-sociality. Um, these are not the ways we're going to make the world. <coughs> we're going to make the world a better place if and only if we think carefully about what policies will achieve this, about what mechanisms we need on a grand scale to achieve this. Now, of course, our feelings of sympathy are an important part of this. But morality consists in the mechanisms for generalizing those spirit feelings and a recognition of the necessity to generalize them. Those we don't get when I introduce molecules into the bodily system that make us more sympathetic to the suffering that triggers our feelings, but may completely leave untouched the suffering that is beyond the very limited purview of our moral so I'm not against moral enhancement, I'm in favor of it, but I think doing it at the level of individual um, bodily functioning, or indeed cognitive functioning, is functional. We need to understand what we have to ensure is done, and we can't do that as individuals. We know what's good, we know what's good for us as individuals and as people, it's not problematic. It doesn't mean the tinkering with uh, molecules, as church term imagines, or uh, drugs. It needs better cognition. And I think the, the, the salvation, there is a route to moral enhancement, it's by cognitive contact, not by trying to make people more touchy feeling with respect to other individuals in the world. That is a that is moral blindness simply because it operates only on what is present to the senses of the particular individual and is rejects how that might be generalized. Thank you very much. Uh, 
this session, um, and recently wrote a book, um, uh, Shaping Ourselves, which is also on the platform. So, uh, Thank you, Martha. It's, it's an honor to be here. I don't see a clock. Uh, I should not go any longer than 30 minutes, so I'll be Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I hope that by the end of my remarks, you will understand what I mean by binocularity and why it is that preposition about uh, thank you very much, is in capital letters. Um, I have, as Marcia mentioned, recently at the beginning of this year, published a book. And it, during the process of writing it, I had on the bulletin board in front of me um, two sayings, um, which caught in diametrically directions. The first um, is this saying of an 8th century Buddhist teacher, if you want the truth to stand before you, never before or against. The struggle between for and against is the mind's worst disease. The second claim I take to be equally profound, and to be the title, it is a title of a civil rights song. Oh, well, yes. Uh, a civil rights song and a chant, and a demand that was made during the civil rights movement in the 1960s. Which side are you on? So the first claim, urging us, exhorting us not to choose sides, and the second, insisting that we do. And I want to try to take seriously both of those injunctions. So what I'm going to try to do is the following. I'm going to offer a very um, brief description of what I'm going to refer to as the first wave of the enhancement debate. And I'm going to invoke this term monocularity. Um, <coughs> you see, you're supposed to be able to see on the right there uh, a representation of the monster in Homer's Odyssey, the Cyclops, the, the one-eyed monster. Um, and I want to suggest that in this first wave, it was characterized by people who were for or against enhancement. I'm next going to try to offer a more hopeful um, account of what I'm calling the second wave of the enhancement debate, which I'm going to suggest we're very much in the midst of, and I'm going to say that this metaphor of binocularity um, can help us in the second wave, and it can help us to go from being for or against to having a conversation about what true enhancement is. And finally, I'm going to offer some evidence uh, of how this um, move towards binocularity, this conversation about enhancement, is already very much going on. So to the first wave of the debate, um, it's all of you, oh, well, yes, as probably all of you, and I know many of you, know all too well, um, the first wave of the debate really pitted enthusiasts about enhancement against critics of it. And I, I don't think I'm over Stating the case too much. Is John still here? Yeah. Uh, uh, when, 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 I, when I say that, when the enthusiasts wrote um, about enhancement, and specifically about what the critics were saying, there was a tendency for the enthusiasts to fail to conceal their sense that the critics were really stupid. That's or idiots. Now, there was an equal tendency, and this is perhaps perhaps the enthusiasm view of the critic, the enthusiast view of the critics was inspired, I think, in large part by the rhetoric of some of the critics who spoke as if the enthusiasts weren't stupid, but they were evil. They had shallow souls. 
right? This did not make for um, uh, a congenial conversation. And by the way, I put some names up there um, just to remind you of the sorts of figures I had in mind. And I put my my own name there, um, not because I had the kind of um, influence that Sandow and Cass and Elliot did, but just to point out that I am speaking from somewhere in particular. And one of the things that really interests me a great deal is the importance of recognizing that each of us speaks from somewhere in particular. Um, this isn't to defer to feeling by any stretch of the imagination. It is, though, to begin to recognize the way in which the reasons that seem strong to us have something to do with our stance toward or attitude towards the world, some of which, much of which, perhaps, I, I think, pre-rational. I don't want to go too far down that path at this moment. Um, I'm inspired by some of what was John was saying, was so very interesting. So, according to my characterization of the first wave of the debate, when enthusiasts talked about what human beings are, the claim was, look, by nature, human beings are creators. It is our job as persons to creatively transform the world, to shape ourselves and our children. And the critics argued with equal um, power and insight, I think, that actually, by nature, human beings are creatures. We've been thrown into the world by powers we don't understand, and a part of our job is to learn how to, infer, to affirm um, and appreciate the kinds of creatures that we are. Enthusiasts tended to emphasize the way in which nature is a mechanism that we can manipulate. Enthusiast critics tended to emphasize the way in which nature is a web that is very difficult to manipulate. Enthusiasts tended to emphasize that technology is a tool that we can put to whatever purposes we want, and critics tended to emphasize the way in which technology is a frame that shapes us. What I um, came to think um, was the following. First of all, as a critic in the first wave, um, I came to notice the partiality of my view. And I mean partial in two senses, right? I mean not only that I was looking at the world from somewhere in particular and seeing only part of it, I do also mean that I was partial to the reasons that I was offering. They had something, they had a resonance for me. The second thing that I came to see about my own participation in the debates, the first wave, was the utter foolishness of having to choose between binaries like the one I put up on the first page. The idea that we have to choose between thinking of ourselves as creators or creatures of nature as a mechanism or a web or as technology as a tool or a frame seems to me utterly silly, and I, I hope it seems equally silly to all of you if you give it a moment's thought. So it was my own participation in that first wave that moved me to think that it would be a good idea to try to get over being for and against, but to try to think more, talk more about, about what true enhancement is, to use a phrase that uh, I think John Harris used first. Um, I mentioned this metaphor of binocularity, this tool that I have found enormously useful. I encountered it first in the work of the great Jonathan Glover um, in an essay, a Tanner lecture that he wrote, I think it was in 2003, called Humanism and Society. You have to remember um, what binocularity means, or I need to explain it to you. I, I'm not referring to binoculars, although that's an interesting metaphor, too. If you can make this, this out, you're supposed to see a nose and two eyes, and you know, the optic nerves going back to the visual cortex, and this is the visual field. You will notice that each eye 
picks out slightly different information about the visual field, and our brains are able to integrate the different information about the visual field to give us depth perception. People who have well aligned retinas can see in depth because of this capacity of their brains to integrate um, the slightly different visual information to one 3D picture. <coughs> when Glover wrote, he was thinking about or was exhorting us to think, to use the idea of monocularity in thinking about the nature of persons. His argument was, look, if you're a psychiatrist, and I would argue if you're a thoughtful human being, you need to understand the person in front of you with two lenses. You have to see them as an object, and you have to see them as a subject. That is, as an object, I am an object, and I, my behavior admits of explanation. You can tell a very long causal story about the words that are coming out of my mouth at this moment, and it would stretch from how my genes are firing, and neurons are firing, and microbiota are churning, and methyl groups are expressing themselves in and how little sleep I have, and how you're looking in the room, all of that would, would be part of a very large, long, causal explanation of why the words that are coming out of my mouth at this point are coming out of my mouth. And that, I guess, principle could be interesting and important to understand what's coming out of my mouth. Lover's point was that if you want to understand a person like me or like you, it's not enough to understand her or him as an object, you have to understand her too as a subject, as a being for whom there is something that it is like to be in the world. If you want to know what it is like for somebody to be who she is, you need to ask, you need to engage in the work of understanding. Glover's claim was, again, to understand us, you need both of those lenses. Now, and so, I'm deeply indebted to Professor Glover, and no nothing else I say that should be blamed on him, um, because he didn't say anything the rest of what I'm going to say. Um, I think it's useful to notice that whereas we can achieve visual binocularity, we can use two lenses at once, I actually think that when it comes to intellectual matters, we cannot achieve perfect binocularity. I don't think that we can use two lenses at once. Any more than any of us can see this figure as a duck and a rabbit at the same time. Right? If you can see it as a duck, if as an animal oriented towards the left, and then you can see it as a rabbit an animal oriented to the right. But in order to go to see it as a rabbit, having once seen it as a duck, you need to shift your attention. This is true no matter how smart you are. Um, this is the way it is. I'll let. Now, John, John can see it as a duck and a rabbit at the same time, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Even John can't. Notwithstanding the very clever remark he just made, we, we have to shift our attention ever so slightly to see it first as a duck and then a rabbit, or a rabbit and then a duck. And I want to say that I think it's probably like that with many of the binaries that we have to work, that we need to work with. I think that if you want to understand persons in depth, I think you probably have to very rapidly oscillate between um, uh, I think we need to very rapidly oscillate between seeing us as subjects and objects if you want to see persons in that. And what I want to suggest is that if you want to see true enhancement, what it is, if you want to have a conversation about what true enhancement is, then you need to get better, we need to get better at oscillating between seeing ourselves as creatures and love, you know, as back and forth. Um, 
it seems to me enormous, I found it very important to recognize, to take on board John Harris's claim that critics actually aren't against true enhancement, they're against an intervention that somebody says is an enhancement of what they take not to be one. Similarly, enthusiasts um, are not for fake enhancement. Um, one of the things that critics always worry about is that enthusiasts want us all to take some of Yet I've never, ever heard of an enthusiast who is advocating um, SOMA, right? That, that, we don't want it because it wouldn't be a true um, enhancement. Enthusiasts are not for fake enhancements. So what I want to um, offer then uh, quickly is some evidence of the inocularity in the second wave. And I do think um, that one of, one of the keys is to try to distinguish between um, true and fake enhancements, true and phony enhancements. And some of you may have noticed that this does appear to entail a new binary opposition, and you would be absolutely um, right about that. I don't think there's any escape from binaries. I think all there is is vigilance about them. Um, one of the first examples that I noticed in the literature of attempting to distinguish in a clear way between um, true and fake enhancements was in an article that Andrew Sandberg and um, Julian Zabalescu wrote, um, I think in 2008, and I can't remember exactly the title, but it was on love chemicals. And many of you are familiar with it. In that piece, um, they made the following distinction. They said, look, we are all for a biomedical means or a biotechnological intervention that could help to maintain a marriage. So for example, they were all for a pill that a couple could take that would facilitate their capacity to engage in a reasonable conversation about their problems. They were for that kind of intervention that would maintain. What they were against was trying to take a pill to create out of whole cloth love. And they used there some language that might have been somewhat surprising to many of their readers at the time. They said, the use of drugs to instill a new love is more likely to create inauthentic love, um, since the causal reasons for the love may lie in the drug rather than in the particular person love. So again, this idea that there's a difference between trying to facilitate our ability to engage in the world as it is, as we are, is different from trying to, out of whole cloth, create something that wasn't there. I think that this question about the pill to love is actually a pretty decent um, opportunity to think about um, the difference between true and fake. It seems that we would, to me, that we would reject the pill that tried to create out of whole cloth love because such a pill would separate us from ourselves, from who we really are and how the world really is. And I, it seems to me fair enough, although it seems to me fair enough, to suggest that we all want to engage in activities that actually make us worthy of being in love, of being in love, that is, we don't want to be loved on the basis of a misapprehension. We don't want to love people on the basis of a misapprehension. Uh, I don't want my partner just to appear to be good. I want her to be good, and I chose to see the same way. Um, we want to freely choose whom to love. Um, we don't want a drug to do the choosing for us. Um, and we want to be loved by others who freely really choose love to love us. Even David Levy, who wrote this wildly enthusiastic book on love and sex for robots, um, said that, well, he had to acknowledge in the end that yes, in a pinch, if there aren't any human beings around to love, take a robot. But that isn't what anyone um, wants. Um, we do want um, a carbon-based human being who has apparently chosen us. Uh, 
So it seems to me that this talk about um, joy is going to require um, a renouncing of absolute commitments to enthusiasm or criticism and this oscillation between um, the, in the insights that are emphasized by the critics and um, the enthusiasts. It seems to me that, um, and I just want to give you a few specific instances of evidence of shifting um, uh, openness to emphasizing the insight of the other. Um, so we all agree now that we are um, creators and creatures. It seems to me that um, in Harris's, John Harris's discussion of moral enhancement, we see there, um, to my mind, um, a, a, a wonderful move on his part to um, emphasizing the way in which we are creatures. By that I mean, um, he, he says that um, this experience of freedom is an essential feature of the kinds of animals that we are. As he put it, sufficiency to stand is worthless without the freedom to stand. Um, this essential feature of human beings is associated, not infrequently, with suffering. Nonetheless, it seems to be utterly essential. We wouldn't want to leave, leave lives without the loss of that freedom would be too big a price. Indeed, as he says, it wouldn't be um, an enhancement worthy of the name, trying to make us less free for the sake of making us better. That would not be a moral enhancement. It wouldn't be a moral enhancement worthy of the name because it would be to deprive us of this essential feature of the kinds of creatures that we are. Again, enthusiasts tended to emphasize the way in which nature is a mechanism, um, and alas, I think some of them are doing that way too much still, but um, this is an example of enthusiasts who are emphasizing the way in which nature is a web that it's exceedingly difficult to try to successfully intervene in. Um, and I'm thinking about here examples like the Chan and Harris uh, discussion um, of the problems associated, as John mentioned a little earlier, the problems associated with trying to reduce or trying to make people averse to um, causing harm. Um, one of the problems with trying to make people morally better in that way is that you might indeed suppress their capacity for courage. They use the example of the guy in the airplane. Imagine that his um, aversion to causing harm was sufficiently reduced he wouldn't then be able to have the courage to stand up and um, save himself <coughs> and the group. Similarly, with this imagined moral enhancement of attempting to combat prejudice, the price to pay would perhaps be the reduction of capacity for him enhancement, and that is perhaps too, price, too big a price to pay. My only point here is that once again, in this instance, we've got enthusiasts talking about nature as a web in precisely the kinds of ways that we found critics talking about it earlier on. And by the way, of course, my point is not that you know, it's all the enthusiasts are coming over to see the, 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 you know, the, the light uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's going the other way, too, I hope. Um, I've spent a lot of time trying to make the argument that technology um, is a frame, that technology um, frames the choices that we make. I spent a lot of time trying to make an argument that means matter morally. And I think they do. Um, I think that different means can indeed reflect um, different <coughs> understandings of what persons are. If we give somebody a drug, we're treating her as an object, as a mechanism whose behavior can change rapidly. If we use words, we're treating her as a subject, someone who can give and take reasons. Um, there are different understandings of what persons are. The means, the different means we can use can emphasize different values. The, the drug can emphasize the value of efficiency. The words can emphasize the value of engagement. Again, I take these to be important observations about the way that means can matter. However, it seems to me funny at uh, this point that it's no noticing that means matter and noticing that technology can be a brain 
certainly is not sufficient to underwrite any kind of wholesale rejection of biomedical means that are aimed at true enhancement. So, for example, it seems to me that a critic ought to be able to sign on to exactly the kind of thing that Anders and Julian were uh, suggesting, some sort of safe drug that could facilitate our capacity to engage in activities in the world as it is and as we are. And by the way, perhaps this is something we could talk about later, because I take that to be a moral enhancement, but it's not perhaps, I mean, it's not kind of moral enhancement that John has in mind. I, I would love to have more of that conversation. So, in sum, um, yeah, of course, it, it's incumbent upon us. It's utterly essential. It would be morally irresponsible for us not to choose sides in many political debates. As I say, for me, um, the civil rights um, debate is about as great an example as one possible to come up with. Um, it seems to me, though, that in trying to understand concepts like enhancement, we don't, we don't have to um, choose sides. It seems to me that in seeking to um, enhance our understanding of enhancement, um, it will help to engage in more binocular thinking, um, to oscillate between those lenses, those insights of the enthusiasts and critics, and that it will help to try to get over the pleasure that we take in being for or against and to try to have more of a conversation about um, what true is. So, thank you. So, my name is Andrew Baccarini and I'm from the University of Rijeka and I have a question for Professor Harris. Um, related to the central idea, you said that ethics is for bad guys. So, uh, my, my worry is whether it is it possible to have ethics for bad guys? Because you said I'm a bad guy, but we know you are not a bad guy. So, let's speak about the really bad guys like Eichmann, for example, who said, oh, I was just organizing trains. So it's a guy with totally not considering. And uh, let's imagine also unable to consider, because he was intelligent, and obviously he knew there were people there, there were people suffering there. But uh, was a consideration totally uninteresting and totally not moving and something simply outside his possibilities of perception. So my question is, is it poss really possible to have ethics for such kind of guys, or is it maybe better to slightly reformulate your formulation and say, well, ethics is for imperfectly good guys? That's, that, that's a fair comment, and of course, you're right. That's why I have constantly opposed the sort of in interventions that Julian Imar and, uh, for that matter, Patricia Churchill, well, which would reduce our uh, capacity for aggression and for violence. Sometimes we need, to, we need to retain that capacity precisely for the guys like Eichmann, who are, as it were, beyond the pale, uh, are beyond redemption. And if we if we make it impossible <coughs> for us to react appropriately to people like that, and by appropriately, I mean, if, if we can't stop them doing what they're doing by other means to exterminate them, 
we need that capacity. Uh, and that, if you like, is an essential part of our, uh, of our creative nature, of the creation of uh, this Darwinian or indeed uh, um, a deity of one sort or another. Well, people, you know, do the specific. I never, you don't do it. I, I didn't, I never used the word creative, right? No, <laughs> from a creature is interestingly ambiguous between. Yes, I think that um, so the, 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 the object of an act of creation uh, of, it, of, of it, well, it's ambiguous. It, it means both of those things. But anyway, to, on, on your point, um, I'm not sure. Uh, historically, it's very difficult to, uh, it's, and perhaps completely pointless to guess it, uh, the nature of Eichmann. I mean, you're, you're familiar with Hannah Arendt's wonderful book, Eichmann in Jerusalem comes up with this phrase actually right at the end of that book about the banality of evil. That he appeared to be simply uh, not straightforward to evil because he didn't see He appeared not to see what he was doing. <coughs> and so on. And I say I think this is for bad guys to get back to the community of question because of course not bad guys beyond redemption as it were. Not bad guys who are incapable of seeing the difference. But bad, bad guys who like most of us um, need to have it made easier for us to make the right sorts of decisions. It seems to me that that's a cognitive activity, which is why I think uh, cognitive advancement is a good philosophy. Good question. Thank you. Uh, Marco Azevedo, I'm from Brazil. Uh, I actually have a question <coughs> to uh, parents. Uh, uh, I, I like your presentation very much. Uh, uh, it has uh, several insightful uh, reflections on, on more discussion. But uh, I think you try to present uh, the two, uh, two poles of the discussion uh, and uh, in a sense that they can be well, the, the decision can be viewed by a binocular uh, stance, let me say. And uh, uh, I, as I saw, uh, uh, for, uh, for example, uh, but I, I don't see the, your presentations as, as the first side and the second side and their metaphysical views as uh, uh, parted from the, the uh, as, as seeing the views on investment as different. For example, I agree with you that we are creatures. Uh, uh, I agree your view on tools and human as subjects, but I'm not against enhancement. And so uh, uh, the, the idea that the, the poll of uh, people that have this, those kind of metaphysical views are usually against enhancements, uh, this, is, this, this is something I, 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 I can't understand exactly because uh, uh, I can see uh, people that uh, agree with you the physical side of the discussion and agree and support enhancement. So they, you are right that they support enhancement in the reflective uh, binocular uh, uh, conclusion, let you say. Uh, but uh, my point is that if we see us as creatures uh, and human subjects uh, to their frames, we can, for example, see that representations are not exactly as you support it. You, you, you presented a representation of the duck and rabbit, and you said, you said that when you see this representation, you, you need attention to see a rabbit, and you need attention to see a duck, and we cannot see both at the same time. But some representations, uh, as I understand, as Ruth Milligan, for example, su suggested, uh, uh, presents things in the same side, not exactly the same side, the script the same side. But, uh, uh, for example, an ex uh, a representation of a uh, 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 traffic uh, sign, for example, has a descriptive and a directive content in the same at, the, uh, at the same moment. And so maybe, uh, she, she, she suggested, some representations are push me to you representations. Do you know that? Uh, this is a, a personage of uh, 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 Dr. Dolittle's uh, stories. So uh, this is a, an animal with two heads. It's a llama with two heads. <coughs> and so she's, she suggested, and I seem quite convincing, that we have the capacity, and great capacity, and, and she said that it is a natural capacity 
uh, uh, she that has uh, made that example of the dance of uh, <laughs> the dance of bees. Uh, uh, animals can see things at the same time. So uh, I think your view is quite correct, and I agree with you. But uh, the presentation of that, that that we cannot see things at the same time, I think, is quite wrong. Uh, that we maybe we cannot in a reflection. <coughs> but we, uh, we uh, in, in our habits, in our behavior, we, we do at the same time. Maybe I should let the, 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 the comments, yeah, the, 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 the observation is that we, um, we can, in fact, see um, both at once. And um, I'm happy to let that um, stand. Uh, <laughs> How about this? If you can do that, my hat is off to you. Okay? I, I think that's I think we should all aspire to it. And so if some of us are achieving it, I think that's a good thing. Uh, what I'm most interested in is the way that most of us latch on to one lens or the other. Because oscillating takes energy, and we all want to come to conserve that energy. So if there are people who are successfully integrating the two, wonderful. <coughs> For the rest of us, though, I, all I'm doing is asking that we pay attention and be vigilant and remember that there is another lens that some of us aren't seeing at the same time. So I, <coughs> I take your point. I don't know if you from some of us universities of South Africa. Uh, I would like to do uh, Facebook for the first to your uh, uh, presentation. I'm not sure whether I understood the example of uh, the pill falling in love uh, entirely correctly. Um, suppose a man and woman fall in love, and then after a couple of months or maybe a year or two, some psychopathic tendencies in the, in the husband comes to the fore. Surely there wouldn't be a problem if you try and give him a pull to rectify that. But wouldn't it even be better had those tendencies been able to be identified on a genetic level very early on in his life? Wouldn't it have been better to have given him a pull right from the beginning and in that sense enhanced him in order to prevent the kind of difficulties that they were going to have? It sounds like the treatment of mental illness is the small core of it whatever combination of drugs and words works. So you'll, you'll get no argument from me for that. Um, the pill example, I, the, one of the assumptions is that two people freely enter into an agreement that they are having trouble communicating and, I'm, and they have reason to believe that this pill could facilitate their capacity to engage in conversation. And indeed, I think there are many psychiatrists who argue that SSRIs, which we can all have, we all have lots of knowledge about, thoughts about, fantasies about, um, and some argue that one of the things that SSRIs can do is facilitate a person's capacity to engage in CBT or other forms of talk therapy. So again, for me, a pill that makes sense is one that facilitates our ability to engage in activities in the world as it is that we are, as opposed to a pill that out of whole plot creates this sense of being in love. <coughs>
those justifications in, 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 in most societies governed by the rule of law are very difficult to come at. Now, what I'm suspicious about is, as it were, doing things that are the moral equivalent of the rule of law, but without going through the processes, the judicial processes that have been tried to do that. So I think that there is a very big danger in saying, ah, we have a quick fix here, we have a chemical fix, um, and why would we? Why wouldn't you put it in people's tea? <laughs> if solve the problems of their marriage or reduce the psychopathic I think we need a very clear picture of what we're entitled to us. This is you kind of refer to the paper where the moral enhancement and freedom from which I talk about use Milton's paradise lost, as I call it the title. We need to be very clear that we have the appropriate justification. For, for those sorts of interventions. I don't say that they're impossible, those justifications uh, cannot be uh, readily achieved, they may be, but we need uh, a, a system of checks and balances for that. It's amusing to be on the our traditional embassy, but yeah. Um, the, 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 you want to get in the You're completely wrong with me. It's interesting that we make different assumptions. See, I, I, I understood that the pills were. And you went quickly to not treating the performance, but imprisoning someone, essentially. And that would make a big difference. Well, it would prevent it. It would prevent it. Well, I'm interested in the question what the diagnosis of something as a mental illness uh, answers no important moral question. But we, we use it as a surrogate for answering those questions. Namely, is, is this behavior that society is entitled to constrain in ways that leave no choice to the subject? That is a very important question. But it's not solved by whether or not we call it a mental illness. That question is a very fundamental question about civil liberties, which has to be addressed, it seems to me, head on, and, 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 and not described in quasi medical charge. I'm not suggesting that that's what you're doing, but it's very easy to do that. This is a mental illness, so this is a medical question. It's not, it's not, a, it, 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 it's not a judicial question, it's not a question of criminal law. It, it, it's, it's another sort of question. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah. No, no, no. Okay. 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 Uh, basically, what we are discussing here are kind of hypothetical interventions that could be developed in the future. So, I'm interested in what is your stance, or where does chemical administration, for example, fit in, in your viewpoint or stance? I mean, it's an intervention that's already present, available, uh, it impacts mood, it impacts behavior, and in one sense, it can be construed as moral enhancement, or ethical enhancement, let's say. So, do you have a stance towards that, or how does that fit in your? I hate, I, I, mean, I hate to repeat it. It's complicated for precisely the reason because we need, first, before we can answer that question, we need a view about when the subject uh, might have that question settled for them by outside. So it seems to me that chemical castration um, is the equivalent of physical castration. And I mean, when would a society be entitled to do that to somebody without their consent. Well, one answer might be when they're entitled to imprison them without their consent. That might be a plausible answer to how to get at that right. What I'm worried about, and so I don't think it's got anything to do with the enhancement, but I, I'm worried about us taking a shortcut to the answer to that question, which would, be, which would evade the burden of proof that would be required for it may or may not be frustration. And this relates to the lot of it. I'd like to come back to that, but I'll talk to you But um, perhaps an answer to a future question. But I don't want us to, I don't want us to, this is a question of what is the appropriate description of what's going on. And it's very easy to think that we can, we can evade the consequences of something that are mad. Taking away somebody's freedom to, to, 
to study comparable to the Holy Spirit, but we do it by a process other than the Holy Spirit. Interaction might be. 
may or may not have an effect on his obviously, he changes his personality and whatever. But it raises a very complicated question about what the difference between what a, a appearance and reality is. And that's what <laughs> to be that, not for it just to, to seem to be that there are as well. And to get at that difference is something that you can't get at with this. I wonder what they might want to solve people's apparent problems with about whether they stay together or whether they don't stay together. You want a particular sort of reality which has a very complicated Content for complicated creatures like us, whether we're uh, creatures in the one sense or in the other. And it's, it seems to me just too improbably simplistic to think that that, that whole complicated thing about what people actually want is going to be delivered by uh, our chemical or molecular change. So this is, I, look, I think it's very important to think of you. I, I don't know. <laughs> because you're a real person. <laughs> what I mean, what I'm trying to say, what I mean, what you were describing is the creation of love out of whole cloth. It is a, it, 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 that is what the most is, yeah. is trying to create love out of whole cloth. And that isn't anything remotely like what any of us want or means by love. Um, so none of us, I think, is going to recommend any kind of pill that is going to have anything to do with that kind of activity, right? I'm simply trying to carve out a space for um, people using a pharmacological tool to try to facilitate the capacity to engage in the kinds of activity that most of us would say does work to build a love. It's kind of important to distinguish that if you already have a nice uh, loving relationship, but the flame is fading, that can fade for reasons which are very unlike the kind of reasons that make people fall in love, the particulars about personality, the particulars about situation, which are very complex, and that will create them out the whole of their grief that is problematic. However, if the flame is just fading, feeding it, either using a pill or by using one kind of therapy, that seems to be taking something that is authentic, recognizing that it has some other feelings, which are kind of trivial, like chemical therapy, perhaps, and making use of that in order to get this rich, complex feeling that the individual program. So I do hope for a question that raises some more controversy now. Because it's really Thank you. I'm Johanna Wallner from the University of Helsinki, and uh, I just wanted to, to continue this uh, this wonderful kind of remark on on the, on the complexity of, of taking sides and, and so on. And uh, I think that we agree that uh, the our topic of research of investment here is a particularly taking sideish uh, topic of, of, of research, and uh, I think it's kind of it is at odds. With the, with the kind of ethical framework we, that we are, despite this taking sides, we are taking in kind of medical ethics. And uh, I think one, one contradiction is that on, on the other hand, we are, we are taking sides, at least in the, in the first way that, that, that you kind of described. But on the other hand, we are operating in some kind of a neutral framework of medical ethics and uh, biomedical language and, uh, and medicine and, and, and so on. So maybe a, a good starting point for the, for the second wave or the ongoing second wave would be kind of to admit that, that the enhancement discussion is not neutral, it's not medicine as the Many many authors want to want to say that enhancement and medicine are different, and kind of admit if there is some uh, political or non-political or maybe we should admit that we have, we take sides and why some people take so strong sides and it's not medical ethics and it's not neutral. So maybe that would. Maybe that would be one starting point to understand 
enhancement of nominee neutral. I'm all for recognizing the partiality of our starting points, absolutely. I mean, just very, very quickly, I'm very, I'm very fond of saying if it isn't good for you, it's not enhanced. That's a way of just reminding ourselves that enhancement isn't just justified, though uh, it often seems to be the augmentation of particular powers and capacities that we have. You know, like more endurance, more intelligence, uh, more resistance to disease, a whole range of things that we would, uh, most of us, whether we're on one side of the enhancement plane or the other, would regard as uh, in some circumstances highly desirable. So we need the enhancement to make invites us to reflect on uh, and whether or not it actually is good for us, whatever is proposed. But there is a genuine disagreement, uh, and nonetheless, at the root of the pro and con, I'm not saying it necessarily applies to whatever differences might make remain between Eric and I by the time we finish speaking, which looks as though there may not be many. Um, but it, there is a, a genuine difference, and it is in, in the sorts of views, for example, that Ian Cass and, and others have often described, that we, we, have, we have to accept the world. We have to accept a certain way. Acceptance is a moral which We have to accept our lot. And that is what I think people who are pro enlightenment reject completely. There's no <laughs> merit in accepting, in necessarily accepting the given. We want, we want to be critical of the given and reserve the right to change it in ways that we can. So have we, have we yes, 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 we do. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, 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 I, I think you have overstated the disagreement with and asked the following way. Uh, and I tried to suggest it in my talk. Um, surely he overstates the case for um, the given, or at least he doesn't let on to the kind of nuanced understanding that I know he has. But my point is that this is part of you know making an argument to go be exaggerated. But what I was trying to suggest is that in your exhortation of us to preserve freedom and the suffering that goes with it, the, the falling that goes with it, is you affirming, making exactly the point that Cass has been making, um, albeit in language that is not congenial. Um, I, so I think you overdraw the, um, the difference between at least you and him on this particular point. And so far, it's again, you are affirming the givenness of our freedom and the default, the default that goes with that, and the suffering that goes with that. No, no, um, no I think we have, do have a genuine disagreement here. You know, and I, I see no merit at all in suffering. Um, but it may be other things that we want, rationally want, um, may expose us to some sort of suffering. And love is a very good example of that. Love is a lot of good yes. Of voluntarily assumed suffering. <laughs> 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 uh, and, and, but we would like to have less of the suffering, and, uh, but also to keep the other things that, that are part of it. And so I, I, I do think that there is a. Uh, I, I, I do think I have cast back to rights, actually, in, in thinking that there is genuine virtue just in the suffering part. But I think he talks about being you know, people like him, and also they talk about learning from it and it being um, an, essential <laughs> an essential feature of our being. And I, I think where it's detachable and it doesn't affect the other things that we have to, we should detach it. So there is no, you know, there is no point that people like us, I can't think of a particular approach, and they well, you know, Gives so many opportunities for altruism, but as it's the person suffering with this, forget all that. I think that's just nonsense. John, finish it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, again, I, I think that rather than emphasize his, his 
sex as a stereotype. Um, uh, I, I, I regret having used the word suffering, which I guess can touch the nerve of the word preacher. Um, I don't need either of those terms to have any religious resonance, which I fear resistance. <coughs> um, I know it's not resistance. Um, all I meant was that. I mean, you just repeated what I said, actually, in language that you preferred. Um, you think that love entails suffering. Um, choice is an important part. Freedom is an important part of love. And you want to affirm that package. No, I think it may entail suffering. I mean, people who choose it, we've got to entail that that's wrong. OK, but if, you know, if, if there are ways you can do that, you, you can make it work you know, without any of that. That's great too. So the suffering that's great too sensual part of it. I think Why um, cognitive enhancement could, in, in that universe, 
between the two ways. But as I think you're reminding us, in the case of moral enhancements to individuals, um, and certainly Aristotle didn't think that cognitive enhancement would have damage difference, have any effect at all on moral behavior, right? People aren't moral because they've been educated well. They are moral because they've been habituated. Um, they've shown, they've observed people who act well and have been trained to be to act well themselves. So, we, so I'm, I, I think your advice is very good. Which, what context are we talking about? I guess you can, you know, I think they mean by moral enhancement. Um, I'm uh, on a meet from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, I, yeah, I want to uh, see what you think about, mm -hmm. or what you think about the, the, the social critique of NSA. And that's the thing that uh, people that we have in the kind of society, that we have the smarts and the economy <coughs> will have access to enhancement or not the tour for the not smart uh, people. And of course, if you're smart, you tend to be wealthy, and if you're wealthy, you tend to be <coughs> kids who are smart and so on. And, and, you know, I mean, very often, life prospect is determined by a very important exam, the A-level, the SAT, the IP, and so on. So I'm just wondering what you think about this problem. Now, the uh, first was mentioned that uh, as a matter of subscribe, as it is, from the point of view. But I think many people also question it. Uh, the question of unconsciousness is not unconscious or not important. That would be a crazy view. The, the view that I think is not all plausible is sometimes all non consequential. So maybe that consequences and other things such as justice, fairness, desert, and so on are also important. That's sometimes all for non consequential view of things that are caused by crisis care, for instance. And I myself, in my mind, the more plausible view would be contactism uh, proposed by, by many people and particular things that on this view and on other people's view, such as draws and other people, um, and act, and by extension of policy, is permissible. <laughs> if I don't believe it can be justified, so everyone affected by the author of the act. But it seems that in this case, unless our society is to change, it's very difficult to justify with those people who are worse off. Because they will actually become worse off as a result of other people being able to buy and buy for content. There's a question about uh, an inequality <coughs> and increasing inequalities uh, and whether it's required to be this is a similar to the trend of the two years. I usually say that it, 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 it's only my enemies that come in. Um, Consequently, it's just one style of reasoning, and I don't know any uh, moral theory which doesn't use consequentialist reasoning. Uh, I mean, we don't want to get into a debate about what the right method of ethical theory might be. It seems to be a sterile sort of activity. But I think the, the, the fundamental problem that you raised is the problem about justice and what justice requires of us. Um, when not all people will have access to whatever that benefit is going on. Because that is true of any benefit whatsoever. It's true of any conceivable benefit. The only way you get the sort of justice that would not fail that test is by leveling that. Because to make everybody at the same <coughs> terrible level of welfare, nobody, <laughs> everybody has a miserable life, you get that sort of justice. Any Anything that is monetizable will be differentially distributed. So then the question arises, is it ever justifiable to introduce something, whatever sort of economy it is, that is monetizable? Um, and that leads to a further question, which is, what would a moral theory be like that said, we cannot give benefits to anyone unless and until we can deliver them to anyone? And no, there is no conceivable benefit that humans have ever uh, invented that would meet that test. So what we have to do is not grasp the impossible. We have to try to make sure that benefits are as widely available as possible. Knowing, of course, that everything is, is expensive and 
Only the rich will access new stuff, because new stuff is expensive. Um, is that a terrible world? Well, it's not an ideal world, but it is rather like Winston Churchill's famous remark about uh, democracy. Democracy is the worst of all political systems, except for all the other. And trying to maximize the delivery of benefits to people is, yes, that it, it's a terrible system, except for not trying to maximize benefits. <laughs> general observation about education and the heavy issue generally how you decide it or not. Um, it, it seems to me that the, that the first two decades uh, of this early literature about genetic investment was more um, impulsive, more bold, more there was more language of uh, uh, must and must not. Uh, it seems like in recent years um, Many prominent thinkers uh, in the field, such as yourselves and others, uh, have um, receded from me. They've started to talk about the, the debate in general. The title of the, uh, this conference included, rather than um, keeping and um, it's like you were having a second thought about it. instead of uh, you know advancing with all your force and uh, what's uh, the enhancement is good or bad, worthy or unworthy, you stop to think whether uh, what exactly are we talking about here, where this uh, 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 debate is going, where the technology is going, and uh, for new researchers like myself, uh, it seems like I'm boarding a train. When all the others, when all the other prominent thinkers have started you know, to, take, to go down the and then stop and think about how to do it. That is your opinion, please. I'm not thinking the first song. I still have a very clear picture. Um, I mean, that's why I've entitled my next book, I Be Good. I think there are ways of being good. I think it is wrong to the point of criminal not to pursue those ways. Um, but I, I think there has been a certain mentality about what constitutes the good. We need to have a clearer picture of that, which I, I hope I'm trying to achieve. So I, I don't think that I've got it. Uh, you may think so, and you may be right, because we, we humans are uh, congenitally self deceived. So I certainly may be deceiving myself about this, but I don't think that's any of uh, my revolutionary fur, but what I see as my task. I started writing about human enhancement, which was in the 80s, uh, or, or even earlier than that, um, is a, an attempt to clear away all of the fallacious arguments that are constantly presented to stand in the way of people trying uh, to enhance themselves and others. And that is, as it were, I think that remains my mission. And I think if you read any of the stuff I'm writing on this, I don't think I'm uh, <laughs> retracting from that in any way whatsoever. But I think in you know, the context of this very nuanced discussion that we're having, there are uh, a number of uh, points of agreement. And where you can reach points of agreement with people who otherwise disagree with you, that's always a sensible way forward. I wish earlier, by the way, I mentioned in the context of the discussion about the other titles. Michael Haskell was a very nuanced account of, uh, it's a naturalized account of what he was communication the baggage that makes a lot of us uncomfortable. Um, I did, my publisher wanted enhancement to go to the title of my book, and I, I, I didn't want, I don't like the term enhancement. The question to me, and strangely there at the end, the question to me is a visit an enhancement book. The question is, how ought we to shape ourselves? Um, and um, so, I don't know, to some extent, that, that does put me in a, a different place from where I was. But I'm curious, when, when you say you're in the field and um, there, there sounds to be, there seems to be a little bit of disappointment in there. Uh, <laughs> some of us there are headed, and I'm just curious. <laughs> well, no, no, but I'm just curious. It's just uh, uh, that um, the, the earlier writing, I mean, again, the 
last two or three decades, it seemed to be maybe because the, the topic was was newer, maybe uh, maybe more exciting or controversial. Uh, it could be any more controversial than it is today. Um, it seems that the writing was um, somewhat bolder, or uh, uh, you could really find two opposing uh, poles. Uh,
prior to creating this agreement, um, you mentioned in passing um, your uh, estimation of reason and your um, skepticism of uh, feeling. And I must say that if I had been bolder today in my talk, I might have had two more lenses of reason um, and emotion or intuition. I, I, I am persuaded by people like Antonio Damasio and the others who argue that um, practical rationality requires having one's emotion and reason well integrated. That it's not, again, it's not a choice of reason or feelings trying to integrate them. That is what we ought to be after. That said, I think we said about church. Can I just add one thing? One of the things I wanted to mention about your presentation is that it was was your, your tribute to Jonathan Glover. And I always feel that I'm a fraud. And I don't always pay a tribute to Johnson Miller. Uh, somebody kind of said of me, I think, I think it may have been you, Bogey, uh, that I sort of had some sort of, uh, I don't know, grandfather uh, status in terms of modern hunting. The real founder of being hunted by Hurley's Dr. Miller. Yeah. All of his books were stunning in their age. He wrote about, uh, he wrote about Wonder Woman and Superman long before I, what sort of people should there be? Yeah. Absolutely exemplary, seminal work in the field of the uh, uh, Although his, his contributions are right across the board in many areas of philosophy, I think it's very important for all of us who now are labeled as uh, involved in the Parliament to, to think about the deputy of the job. I don't think this field would be at all the field of the good idea. Yes. Well, let me, let me clarify. I said that you uh, are considered a man the father of the hands of the Bishop of Sussex School of Disability in the I was very precise. I dream of saying that you are not a precise sort of person. Okay, we've got some more questions here. Peter Sukura from Bracelet. I have a question for one of you. Uh, with this having new DNA and the cloud of the prison. Do you think that these tools, not what we are going to enhance, but the way how we are going to enhance, do you think it's a different category because it's trans generation consequences that we have to pay a special attention to genetic enhancement? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, it, it might have to be presented today as things that I've been writing recently, but it would have been about gene editing. Uh, there are a number of, I've been very involved in the gene editing debate, um, both in terms of mitochondrial replacement therapy, which is a form of gene editing, and they're not using CRISPR, but using a simpler uh, technique. But, but what they all share is the fact that they um, are intergenerational, transgenerational in various ways. Now, there are interesting distinctions about how you just think what, what the difference between intergenerational and transgenerational is. And much of the hostility to the use of gene editing techniques come from the ridiculous state of the patterns of the uh, Oviedo Convention and the UNESCO Zenith uh, in their hostility to germline intervention which is, uh, uh, I think, an absurd. Um, all acts of sexual reproduction are germline intervention. Just not like that they're unpredictable, unfortunately. And they're genetically related, as my clients call it. Once you get a more precise intervention, everybody objects to it. It seems to be rather um, irrational. <laughs> um, but the other thing I think I may be, I may be, very rarely, I think, I think I may be the first person to draw attention to this. Online, is the problem of epigenetics. That in that epigenetic triggers uh, are, all, are certainly intergenerational and transgenerational. We don't know how far, whether they are like the germline, uh, something that will change things in the future, but they're very unpredictable. Now, uh, we are, we, we as the scientific community, not the parasites like me, operate us because parasites from the scientific community are, are, are very well aware that um, the more we find out about epigenetics, the more it is probably going to be possible to 
to identify the triggers for epigenetic changes and utilize them to gain particular sorts of transgenerational effects. Now, what is interesting about this is that they are, they're going to be the sort of things that it's going to be virtually impossible to control. So all of the international uh, uh, they're not in agreement because they're not binding, <coughs> but the international pronouncements about the, uh, why it is unethical to tamper with the germline will, I don't think, be able to touch uh, the emerging field of epigenetics. So we're going to be in a situation where we not only have the randomness of sexual reproduction creating uh, generational effects uh, that operate in perpetuity, um, but we're going to have increasing awareness of how people can manipulate the triggers as they emerge for these effects. And that's going to be, I, I, my guess is it's going to be out of control. I could be wrong about that, but I think this is a very interesting time for us to reevaluate what we, what we think about uh, the deliberate interventions in, uh, in inheritance. Whether, whether they're German interventions or we call them <coughs> so I, I, um, I think I would stick with, with the, uh, the claim I made that uh, I, I think means do matter morally um, in a variety of ways we need to have long conversations about. Um, I, I, I don't think that using genetic means, I don't think the fact that the genetic is sufficient to underwrite the prohibition that, that said, in principle, um, I think it's going to be very important for us to uh, remember how limited our capacity to manipulate the German is going to be. Um, in the case in China, where it was attempted to manipulate the Islam by the embryos, it didn't succeed. And in that case, they were simply trying, simply trying to change one gene. The kinds of traits we're interested in is not curing the disease by changing the same gene, but all of these very complex traits. And I am very deeply involved in the, the, the conversation about genetics and complex traits, which is published in the recent report of genetic intelligence. Believe me, we are, I, I don't, I just don't see this ever being possible at the moment. Um, you know, there are a few um, single nucleotide polymorphisms associated with high intelligence, um, maybe, probably, but nothing remotely like the kind of knowledge that would be required to try to change the germ life for you to enhance the So I, we do have to keep that reality in mind. But that's actually, with respect, that may be true of intelligence. Like, it seems to me on that. I guess it's probably less good than yours, but that would be true of a number of uh, interventions there. I mean, the, the frighteningly wonderful thing about CRISPR is it's a very, very precise technology. When I talk to people, we know they're very confident in being able to target an accurate uh, eventually in human development, but uh, we've got to do the research first. At the moment, we're, uh, we're, we're fighting the Neanderthals who want a moratorium on research. Even research which is never going to uh, at the moment be put into in humans. I'm very, I should declare an interest. I've been very involved in these campaigns. I spoke in our parliament on the eve of the mitochondrial um, uh, vote, which fortunately went in favour of our improving in principle in the UK mitochondrial replacement therapy. Um, I spoke shortly after that in Washington about this. Uh, I think it's been quite an age. I'm speaking at the uh, so-called uh, gene editing summit that's going to take place in Washington the first through third of December. So I am, I am very much involved in trying to ensure that at least the research on this is enabled to continue uh, against forces that want to ban not only the implementation of humans, which it's not going to happen at the moment. <coughs> But also ban uh, any further research. That seems to be very good. Very likely, maybe uh, we'll have your conference again in two years, something. We'll be speaking more about what Chris has been doing within the last. We have our topic already. Sure.
Um, Maybe I'll say by that. Um, so I know there are some more questions, but too many to to accommodate in this hour. But John and Eric are around. Press on the buttons. Well, um, I'm I'm stuck. Right? I, I had a few announcements to make. You want one? So uh, first, first of all, this uh, this debate is already uh, uh, enough for a conference. So uh, it's, it's, it, we don't have much more. A few a few changes in the program. Uh, as Harris Weisman had uh, uh, listed at the airport of London, he will not come. So we will move uh, under some to that panel which will be chaired by Rob Sparrow, whereas Michael Hauskeller will chair panel four in this room. The other important thing, you can register now for the cruise uh, uh, this evening. So it's on the boat, you have, there is dinner and, uh, and the cruise over the Danube and uh, Sava rivers. You can do it at, at, at the front, front desk over there. And the next session will be shorter than this one. Everyone has the right to talk precisely 15 minutes and then after that uh, discussion will take place. We will get three minutes before the end of the presentation and no. And then at the end of the presentation, a nice lady will ring a bell. <laughs> <laughs>